Let me start first by appreciating all you guys who've organized this forum or this session. I mean, if I tell you, I'm not impressed as, you know, to how young Africans can put this sort of event together, I'll be lying. So congratulations. Uh, this morning, or no, this afternoon, I'm expected to put together, I'll tell you in 10 minutes what we've achieved in eight years. So let's see how we'll do it. So if I rush through my presentation, I, be, I don't worry. We have five minutes and some time later to discuss areas I may not have covered. So this afternoon, um, I'm expected to talk about how we can grow our continent and how we have, in a little way, done it in Edo State since I became governor. You know the story of Africa. Africa is full of immense potentials. We stand at the intersection of global trade. We have a very young population. You know, we have great economic prospects, huge natural resources, and on and on. It's not new. But I guess what we are trying to put hands around is the paradox of Africa. You know, yes, we have a very young population, very dynamic. It's a blessing, but if we don't manage it right, as we're seeing in many African countries, it's becoming a problem. We can find jobs for them, and we can engage them. We are beginning to see, in spite of the resources we have, enormous poverty. And we need to navigate this paradox. And for us, I believe, for me, I believe that the way to deal with this paradox and grow our continent, first, we must focus on rebuilding our institutions. I mean, we're all here. This is, has been around for over a century. You know, how many institutions do we have on our continent that we can boldly say we've grown in time? I guess the most important thing we should be focusing on, which we're doing here today, and makes, which makes me really glad, is about human capacity. It's, the, you know, us, the, us humans, us Africans, that will make that change that will recur on our continent. We've got to provide infrastructure and ensure that we take advantage of the competitive advantages we have as a people. How have we tried to deal with our issues in Edo State. Like I said, Edo is just representative of the continent. Young people, five million people, you know, two thirds of them young, are very young, under the age of 30. We're becoming highly urbanized. We have, you know, an average size GDP relative to the rest of the country. We have about 20, 18, 19 million square hectares of farmland, varied, rich. But, you know, in the context of the world, we're still very poor. So what have we, in the last seven years, we've tried to grow that $11 billion GDP. Today, it's almost $25 billion. How did we do it? First, just focusing, like I said, on institutions, focusing on governments, because we've got, a, a, you, you know, only governments can help us organize ourselves. Um, we've reformed our civil service by first rebuilding the infrastructure, going through, uh, cleaning the processes, and then digitizing the way government works. So today, from my desktop, there's really no data I want, I mean, most data I want from government is available. But more importantly, we've worked on the human beings, the civil servants giving them a sense of pride, made them respected, and more importantly, began to understand that they have to be well remunerated. So a few weeks ago, I announced the highest minimum wage in the country. And for me, even that is still inadequate because, as you say, if you pay pennies, what do you get? You get lemons. Um, so big issues around governance, uh, how, you, how you manage your fiscal space, um, how you manage your people, how you manage your fiscal space, and government has the responsibility to do this. 
So focusing on the bureaucracy is key. Secondly, you've got to, I mean, why do you focus on the bureaucracy? Not for the bureaucracy itself, but for the bureaucracy to help people realize their potentials. Government is there, it's supposed to work for us citizens. And to do that, I mean, uh, uh, you've got to have clarity that government's role is not to build the economy directly. Government's role is to create the enabling environment to help citizens achieve their goals. So we've emphasized things to do with creating an enabling environment, making sure there's security, peace and order, that you you know have seamless ways of collecting fair taxes from citizens and on and on. And then also repositioning government to carry out its principal function, which is regulatory. Government is not a business person. Government cannot do business. Government is a very, very bad business man. So, but government needs to understand that and step back and create an environment for people to make money. For us, coming from our unfortunate incident of military rule, where the military saw people who had independence, who were either academics or business people as threats, as, because they could sponsor coups, they de-emphasized the role, that role of government helping citizens to become rich. And this is real at the core of any growth, any economic growth we expect, the human capacity. It's people that make things happen. So government's responsibility must, key responsibility must be to focus on the people. And key to this is education. Almost all governments all over the world say that basic education is free and in most cases compulsory. But we in Edo, when we came into government, um, understood that it was not about schooling. Education is just not about schooling. It's about learning. So we decided to deliberately now begin a process where first we had to focus on foundational education. And I said, look, if I have 100 Naira or $100 to spend on education, I'll spend $40 on foundational education, on, you know, on basic education. And that's what we've done in the last seven years. And you can see the transformation in the kids. So the children in our school system today learn at about 70 to 80% of, you know, at the same rate as their peers in, uh, in Britain or in America. The other thing is education for what? For us, somehow we got, I don't know where we got it wrong, I got to believe that it's education for certificates, education to be employed. But we said no. I mean, it can be education for certificates, it's education to make you useful to yourself and to society, to make you to be able to employ yourself and, and sustain yourself. The other uh, issue we had to focus on was, yes, we got it wrong at some point. You know, we have a generation or two who were not as well educated as they should have been. What do we do with them? We then focused on just remediation, creating, um, creating vocational opportunities. So when I came in 2016, we had a crisis. We had a human crisis. At some point, the international, the international Office of Migration approached me, I think it was January 2017, and said, do you know that you have over 30,000 young Edo boys and girls in Libya trying to cross over to Europe? I said, what? 30,000? Can you imagine how many would have died on that journey across the Sahara? So it was a humanitarian crisis where young people didn't want to stay at home anywhere else but home. They all wanted to travel. So, you know, we're top of the list in human trafficking, top of the list in terms of irregular migration out of the country. That was the, that was the signal. And that's why we had to begin to, by the time we started re repatriating them and getting the data and trying to understand the root causes, we just realized that it was because the educational system had broken and these kids could not see a future. 
The other thing we had, had, have had to do, and I believe the rest of Africa must do, for us to get, you know, to achieve the level of growth we need, is to, we must invest in infrastructure. And two critical infrastructure, beyond roads and bridges, is power, electricity, and digital. We are lucky because of the location of Edo State. We are right there at the core of infrastructure in the country. And so we're the cheapest point to generate electricity because we have both trans the transmission grid and the gas grid running across our state. So today we supply, we account for almost 12, 13% of the power in the national grid. But more importantly, we have gas, onshore gas, and we've been able to encourage investments to produce power. So we have IPPs running most of our services in, in the state. But the thing that's significant we've done in the last three years, we have built almost 2,000 kilometers of fiber across the state, connecting the state, such that we now have adequate infrastructure to deliver government services across the nooks and corners of the state. We're just now currently building an additional 300 uh, kilometers to connect schools and primary health care centers so that we can deliver services, you know, remotely. We can deliver telemedicine services to, you know, our Keith and Kin in the rural areas. And lastly, so there's so many things government is expected to do, but you can't do everything at the same time. So you just select what are those key things, key activities that are catalytic and for us, it's manufacturing, because you've got to produce what you consume. You know, this dependency on the outside can't sustain us. And fortunately, since we have the, you know, the, uh, sufficient or adequate uh, energy resources, particularly gas, so why not, you know, work these, sweat these assets so that you can generate enough power to, 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 to have uh, competitive manufacturing. So it's about your people, so that you don't have to import people and you don't have to import power. And what the other thing that makes us really, really unique as I do is our culture. You know, we're the home of those bronzes that are being contested globally. The home of the Benin Empire. And nobody else has that. And we say to ourselves, here is a huge economic opportunity. So if we get back our stolen artifacts we can now begin to explain to the world the civilization we had that helped build what we built before the coming of the Europeans. And that is something we can sell, which is unique. So we focused on that. And so let me just quickly try and round up, since I have 10 minutes. I've talked about uh, um, manufacturing. We've talked about you know, the investors that have been attracted, trying to use things, you know, f use what's available, particularly cassava as energy sources. Um, we've, you know, talked about, you know, how we've encouraged people to come and invest and come and produce, particularly small businesses. They need, you know, locations, they need power, they need policy to support what they're doing. And talked about, you know, culture, where we have now designated a whole cultural district we're building a museum for West African arts. We're, you know, and there's, we're, very, we're a very active archaeological site. You know, as I speak, thanks to the support of Oxford University and a few others. Um, and hopefully, before I leave office in November, would have completed the first phase of this museum, where, which will serve as a storage facility, uh, which was, it will serve as a storage facility for collections. Like I said, we're currently doing a lot of archaeological work, and you know, and um, we've worked with the Benin Dialogue Group to help support the activities to make sure that Edo Benin City becomes a hub for culture in West Africa. So, to conclude, I said first. Governments in themselves can, cannot accomplish much. They have to accomplish what, they set out, what they've set out to do, working with citizens. In Edo, we have prioritized strategic partnerships. 
Um, everything we've done, everything we've achieved is based on how we've created an environment to work with partners on a strategic level and a strategic basis. And this is how we've driven the works that we've done today. So whether it's in the area of technology or skills development, that's the array of partners that we've had to work with across board. Whether it's in education, in the area of agriculture, finance, banking, they were very big with international donors. In manufacturing and small businesses, in arts, culture, media, in healthcare, in infrastructure, in construction, and others. So you can see there was no way as government we could have done this, achieved what we have achieved if we did not create a template and create a structure to work with the private sector and you know, the multilateral and other type organizations. So it's about partnerships. And therefore, if we're gonna chart a new path for Africa, we must now organize our governments at a national, sub-national and sub-sub-national levels. We must, the priority number one must be what we're doing here. As you Africans we must, must be trained. We must train ourselves, train, you know, uh, uh, train ourselves, train Africans, both abroad and at home to acquire, you know, skills and excellence. You cannot survive or exist in today's world or be sustainable without technology. Not technology for itself, but technology to take you or take us where we need to go to. And lastly, in doing all of this, we must never forget who we are. We are Africans. And our goal must be to let the world know that we are like any other groups in the world. Thank you very much. All right. Um, thank you so much. Um, well, I'll call you back, Governor, just to come and we'll have a conversation with you. If you can just come back upstairs and we can have a conversation. Yes, we'll sit together and um, talk through. Um, is the slide up for people to ask some questions? Yes, I'll just sit by your side. Perfect. All right, so while we're waiting for the take team to put the slider up, that was a very insightful conversation that we had there. You talked about, you know, the paradox that we have having a young population, um, a surging youthful population. You also, you know, talked about the oxymoron of how we are so rich yet so poor, but you also encouraged us to, you know, utilize our competitive advantage of, you know, using manufacturing, um, using our culture. So all those are great um, things that you brought up in your talk. So if any of you have questions, please scan the Slido and put your questions out there. But Kennedy, coming from the same state, what did you think about that conversation, that talk? Oh yeah, um, I was pretty um, impressed by how you talked about the flow of migration within the those states and how and the problems with Libya as well. I think a question that I have in fo focusing on that is that knowing that Edo state um, in some ways in opposed we lead in human trafficking and also the diet diet conditions that are um, that are apparent in terms of migration flows. What is the government and uh, which you in leadership doing to in some ways curb that um, at the point where um, there is this narrative that for you to find development and for you to find human mobility and, and growth, um, you need to go to Italy or you need to go to Libya and people take that dire risk in crossing the Mediterranean. And so how is it those states becoming a front runner in terms of dialing that back a bit? Yes, I think, I think that's, the, that's the purpose of my talk, that in seven years, we've reversed that trend from Edo State being the leading state in Nigeria where young people just emigrate from, to seven years after where we are not top 10 anymore. 
where we, we've seen a situation where people no longer want to go out. People are now heading back home because we've created an, an enabling environment, a much safer environment, opportunities for young people. Uh, we have this agency, the Skills Development Agency, Edo Jobs, that has either mentored, supported, skilled, and placed almost 200,000 young men and women in the last seven years. And so where the situation we have today is rather than seeing, I mean, um, migration out, we're now seeing a lot of migration in because people are coming to look for opportunities. Mm. Thank you so much, Governor. Um, you know, earlier today, we were talking about integrating um, Africa, and Honorable Raila Odinga talked about how he's running for the AU. So there's a question that has come in for you saying, you have done great with international partnerships, but what are you doing to promote local partnerships and investments? I think there's been more local partnerships. Unfortunately, I have some of them here. Um, take our whole reskilling of the civil service and public service. What did we do? We had to call in experts. I have Joaba DIA, okay, he has international experience, and our partners here, but he's local, he's in Abuja. Himself and his team have come in to help us work through a whole training program for our public servants. We have the Don John Odigayegu Public Service Academy where we, you know, we, we retool and reskill our public servants. Um, most of our technology implementation, the eGov platform we use in Edo today because we're a paperless government, was developed locally. The ERP was developed locally by local partners. I can't recall, except for like multilateral organizations like the World Bank, um, you know, I'll say most of our initiatives, most of the support we've gotten have been local. All right, so we'll just wrap it up. Um, maybe you could just give us some concluding remarks on this. You've told, uh, told us about the Edo model, which sounds great, but how replicable is this in other places as well? So that's what I'm saying. What's the model? The model for growth is you have to focus on government. You've got to retool and reskill government. And in doing so, you've got to get the people who run government, us politicians, bureaucrats to begin to think differently about their, the services they offer. That government does not act for itself. Government does not in, you know, exist for itself. Government exists for the citizens. So the government cannot be seen to have done well if the citizens are, are not doing well. Because that's the first, and I think it's replicable across the board, whether it's local, whether it's state or federal. The second, which is a corollary to that, is that government is about people. It's about solving people's problems, solving the citizens' problems, making sure citizens are educated, they have good health care, they have water, and whatever else they need to live happy lives. And to do that, you've got to train people. You've got to build their capacity from birth. In fact, what's most important is focusing on basic education, foundational learning. Right? It's, yeah, it's great to be here, to be in Oxford, but if you didn't have strong you know, foundational learning, you wouldn't be here. So you see how many more people, how many more Africans we can create if we just dig, you know, focused on foundational learning. And then also skills. To say, look, you are educated means that you can help yourself. You can feed yourself. You can use your hands. Not looking for work or working businesses or someone else from some parts of the world have created. And then lastly, that everything you need to live, everything you're looking for outside the rest of the world, you also have. Just look in words and use your hands. Oh, beautiful. Right. Use your hands indeed. Thank, Thank you so much, Governor. Right. Thank you so much. Okay. Is excellently Godwin Obaseki. Thank you for your grace, for gracing us with your presence, for your discourse on human capacity and culture and agriculture. Um, we welcome you to Oxford and we wish you luck in your tenure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.